on QNAP this morning. So this webinar is brought to you by Western Digital on our side, and I'm here in temporarily sunny Dublin, and Craig Reed, who's the technical manager from QNAP, is based in the Royal County of Berkshire, home of Windsor Castle. So how's the weather like over there, Craig? It was sunny, but uh, I think it looks like it's about to rain. Yeah, we've had intermittent periods of glorious sunshine, heavy cloud, and thundering hailstones all within you know a 30 minute window. So unfortunately, <laughs> global warming isn't having the positive impact uh, on temperatures we're hoping in this country. So we're gonna give people another minute or so just to log in. Always a couple of people who are grabbing that last minute coffee to sit down and join us. And today, what we're gonna do is uh, have a look at first, um, some of the Western Digital NVMe products. Um, my name is Daryl O'Toole. I'm Senior Product Marketing Manager for uh, Western Digital for EMEA. And today's webinar is hosted by our MyWD team and Veronica is on the line, keeping things running nicely in the background. So first we'll look at our NVMe SSDs and then Craig's gonna take over and give you a deep dive and show you exactly how their amazing new uh, all flash array, I think, Calling it a NAS is kind of, you know, not not even enough. It's it's much more than a NAS device. I don't know, Craig. What what would you call it? Uh, I think the buzzword is unified storage, NAS, SAN, everything all in one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. I kind of felt like it was underselling it, just calling it calling it a NAS. Um, but it's an amazing machine, and we're going to see how the two combine together to bring you a really excellent solution. So first, we kind of look at, at Western Digital. So we we make our own flash memory. So if you're looking at from the SSD point of view, we've great business and hard drives, but SSDs is kind of the future and how it ties into this particular device. We have six fabs, which are flash factories. They're based in Japan. Uh, we have a joint venture with Kyoxia. And we take the output of those fabs. Each fab is kind of the size of multiple football fields. Um, they take multi-billion dollar investments. They can take up to two years to kind of get up and running. So it's not something you can kind of dip in and out of. It's a, it's a serious long-term commitment here with a, with flash business. So we create the wafers there. Uh, then we, we independently go into our own QA process and uh, take the dies. So those little black chips that you see in your SSDs or inside your USB thumb drives, or in your enterprise SSDs, that's the magic, that's the NAND uh, flash. And we've been in the SSD business since about 1991. So we've got a long legacy going back on the hard drive side to IBM and HGST and the flash side to SanDisk. So in 1991, when SanDisk were called SunDisk, we had a 20 megabyte drive. So that was amazing at the time. And the price would make your, your eyes literally bleed. And now we've got um, an over 15 terabyte version, which is our new SN840, um, which uh, we just launched and started shipping this year. Um, so it, it puts it in the halfpenny place, just the, the extent of progress. So our progress with them, um, our, what we call 3D NAND, which is a 3D flash memory, we went from 2D to stacking it layer by layer, is now up to 162 layers. We call that BIX, which is bit cost scalable, and we're at our sixth generation. And as we keep building up, it's not really a race to see who, who can do the highest, like the biggest tower block or apartment block. It's to see how efficient you can make each of those layers. So at cell level and at layer level, how efficient you can make the construction so do you make the walls narrower? Do you, do you make the pipework narrower in your circuitry? And we've now gone to moving the circuit under the array to actually optimize the footprint of the NAND. And that's more important if you're kind of comparing layers and it, it, that's not technically what it's all about. So we're all about efficiency and kind of aerial density in the same way you do with hard drives. We make our own NVMe controllers um, for some of our products. And of course, Enterprise SSD has been a new um, area for us where we're expanding. We look at that then, take it across the whole portfolio. So whether it's the embedded NAND flash memory that you have on your phone, your car, your Hoover, um, all the way up to one of our um, flash powered NVMe over fabric uh, JBOF solutions. We have NVMe is a pervasive technology across our entire range. So we have a lot of expertise. It's not like we make an NVMe SSD, uh, it's across everything. So whether it's the, the actual bridge chips that we use to link your products across the network, whether it's a USB drive, 
some of our consumer solutions like our amazing WD Black SN850. Um, these are all using NVMEs and that uses our G2 proprietary controller all the way up to our, our latest generation zone name storage SSDs, which are enabling much higher capacity and much more effective use of SSDs, which is something that uh, Craig will talk about, kind of the, the awareness of the industry on how to actually leverage SSDs. Because to date, a lot of systems have treated SSDs like fast hard drives, which is very convenient. You know, you could just drop in a three and a half inch or two and a half inch into the same slot and your system thought, hey, that's a fast hard drive. And moving to NVMe made the system aware. It went, hang on a second, that's done just a fast hard drive. That's something completely different. So it's like going from combustion engine to EV technology, where your acceleration is like, bang, instant. You've got instant response from the motor. You've got much lower latency. Um, and when we look at our solutions, for, for NAS especially, we color code our, our general range so it makes it easy for you to select the right solution. You don't wanna to have to go diving into data sheets. You wanna go, listen, I'm a gamer, I want something. We go, okay, WD Black. Uh, if you're a um, surveillance customer, it's like, okay, purple. You just pick your capacity and off you go. And um, for us in the NAS space and the data center, red and gold are key colors. So we're still with red um, for the mainstream and the high end. We've got our three options, WD red for your um, normal, regular home kind of workloads, moving up red plus then into CMR territory. You've got a uh, higher workload capability for small and medium business. And then you're up to red pro on our 7200 RPM drives with kind of extended workload capabilities. And on top of that, we last year launched our SSD range on SATA um, on two and a half inch and M.2 to give you caching abilities. So why NVMe? A lot of you probably go, yeah, we already know, but it's no harm in reiterating it. Um, it's not only five times faster than SATA. That's that's an easy one. That's looking at the top level read speeds, but it's not just about that. It's the fact that NVMe talks directly to the, the, the CPU. SATA goes over a single link, a unidirectional through a host bus adapter, plus the CPU thinks the SATA SSD is a hard drive. So it talks to it in an ancient protocol called AHCI, which has been around for donkey's years. It's very inefficient dealing with flash memory. NVMe talks directly to the CPU over the high speed lanes. Each lane could be 2000 megabytes a second on, on Gen 4. Um, so you get masses of speed, but you also get huge amounts of interrupt availability. So I can knock on the door of the CPU and the command count goes up to about 64,000 commands and 64,000 queues of commands. So you can get a massive amount of throughput and that's the key thing to remember um, with the enterprise SSDs. So that gives you, like we say, quality of service. So if you've a high uh, availability product where you need rapid response, NVMe makes a lot of sense. Um, and on the TCO level, what's really important, I think in the last year, the prices have pretty much come to parity. So it used to be that NVMe was seen as kind of the flashy, the Ferrari, the high end that you only put in the front end. But now because the prices have pretty much come into line, um, the flash memory is similar behind the controller. So now the NVMe controllers and architecture has come into line. It's pretty much price parity. So it makes a lot of sense to take the jump. When you look at our range kind of side by side from left to right, we still have the SATA options. And as you can see, they're in around the 550, 560 um, reads and they have reasonable endurance up to 2500. But when you jump into the enterprise space, especially with the gold and 640, so the gold and 640 are actually based on the same architecture, they're based on the UltraStar drive. The gold is what we call our, our wider channel available um, product. It's available in less configurations, a fixed 0.8 drive right per day. Um, but it, it and the 640 are both approved for, for this particular QNAP product. And as you can see, it's quoted in drive writes per day rather than terabytes written. And the big difference is, you know, a two drive writes per day is going to give you something like close to about 23,000 terabytes written. So it's a significant difference in enterprise SSD positioning versus consumer SSDs. And then at the top of the heap, we just launched a new uh, SN840. So the key difference there is that's a dual port high performance SKU that will be kind of in your SaaS replacement. 
Um, so it's not as relevant for today. Today we're going to focus on the 640 just to show you how they, they all sit together. So the 640 um, had a great review, storage review. It was a, a sponsored review, so um, they were paid to do it, but they, they gave it totally independent reviews. And the main thing was that it's a cost-effective solution that can finally get you off SATA. So no reason to be using SATA anymore. And it was kind of like the great gateway drive, kind of the gateway drug to get you off um, SATA or SAS and onto NVMe. And just basically saying it's the path forward. And it's kind of like, you know, it's like a gun versus a knife fight. Um, it's it's not a fair fight where you really put NVMe versus SATA anymore. And the cost benefit, you might be thinking, well, all my servers and all my stuff is it's SATA enabled. It's so easy just to keep buying SATA. But you're kind of missing the, the, the total cost of ownership point where if you replaced your servers uh, or extended them to use NVMe, the drives and the investment would pay for itself probably in, in the first year of utilization just because of how efficient, effective, how much density you could get uh, with the drives. So SATA runs out of steam and NVMe basically gives you consistent quality throughout um, the, the test cycle. Aerospike have a third party certification program and it shows it on their website versus third parties. So you can see that there, we just can only show you our results um, during this. So the main thing was it came out on top and also beat the performance of some Gen 4 SSDs. So it's kind of another thing to look at. It's not always Gen 3 versus Gen 4, and you have to have the latest. Sometimes um, Gen 3 can perfectly work in the ecosystem that you have. So the context today we're talking about is in the H2490FU. So uh, 24 NVMe SSDs all in one, that's an astonishing amount of performance you can squeeze out of it with um, both of these drives. So we kind of said that two and a half inch U.2 form factor is great because there's a lot of footprint in that. So if you consider M.2 is kind of like a chewing gum stick um, form factor, you're limited to the amount of NAND chips you can get on onto them. So you have a controller, you might have a bit of DRAM and then you have space on each side for, for chips. That brings thermal challenges um, in that small space and capacity. So you relax that when you go to a two and a half inch form factor, uh, and then you can cram loads of NAND chips on, you can use double sided, and you can have seven or 15 mil depths. And that means it's 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 perfect for this kind of application, essentially. Um, the Simply.Reviews was uh, fantastic. The Craig will probably talk more about that, but essentially just saying that um, with the price tag now on the 640 models, available in capacity to suit all budgets. It really brings it more into the mainstream. So we're on the compatibility list for, for QNAP with the WD Gold and the SN640 with all of the capacities and you can check on QNAP's list for any updates. So with that, I'm gonna hand over to the the NAS guru, Craig, who's gonna take you through how, how easy it is to set up and some of the cool features that uh, make it really SSD aware and then some of the performance. So over to you, Craig. Thanks a lot, Derek. All right, so let's uh, switch straight in. So I'll first do a couple of slides, uh, just talking about the NAS itself, uh, just so that I can go through um, some of the functions features so you can see what it looks like, uh, so that you can see the specs of the unit, um, why it's a good unit, um, especially for something like the uh, WD uh, SN640 there. Um, so we'll move straight into that. So here's the two variants that we offer. Um, so the main difference between the two is the CPU. Um, so the one on the top is the one I'm demoing today. It's a AMD Epic, it's a 16 core 32 thread uh, version. Um, the one at the bottom is an eight core 16 thread variant. Um, the RAM is also halved on the bottom model, but both do have the same max RAM of 256 gigs. So you can self upgrade that as well if you want to. Um, so it's very um, cost efficient to, to get those. It's got 16 RAM slots. So either side of the CPUs, um, there's eight RAM slots. Um, both of them also come with two 2.5 gig ports, which also works with uh, one gig. So if you need a management port, you've got it there as well. Um, the top unit comes with four 25 gig SFP ports as standard, whereas the bottom one comes with two. Um, you can expand each 
uh, to whatever um, inputs and outputs that you want. So you've got options for uh, more 10 gigs, so you've got 25 gigs. The 25 gig that we built in does also work. If you put an SFP plus transceiver there or an SFP plus uh, DAC cable, um, it will work at 10 gig as well. Um, and we've also got 40 gig options and we've just announced and just launched the 100 gigs, 100 gig card. So it's a, a dual port uh, Intel E810 uh, chipset. It's um, um, got two uh, QSFP28 connections on the back. Um, so you've got a, a couple of different variants of uh, cables with that. You can go with either a, a straight up DAC cable, or we've also got a breakout cable that converts that uh, 100 gig connection um, out to uh, four SFP28 connections as well from a single port on the back of the card. Um, that card has drivers for uh, Windows uh, as well as the NAS. Uh, currently, this is the only NAS it's certified in. And simply because the back of this unit does have uh, PCIe Gen 4, uh, which uh, none of our other NAS do currently, and it needs the, uh, the, the high throughput, obviously, to drive 200 gig uh, Ethernet connections. Um, you need a, a very fast PCIe slot to do that. Uh, moving into the front view, so everything's very easy to access here on the front of the device. We've got the 24 main U.2 base, um, so they just pop straight out. Uh, there's four screws per drive, so you can pop those in. Um, over there on the right, we've got our QDA-UMP. So if you wanted to go with one of the WDM.2 options instead of the U.2, you can. We've got a, it's a, a metal case, effectively, so you can see the fins on the top of that. Um, so those fins are there to try and get the heat out. As Dara mentioned, you know, heat can be a challenge with the uh, M.2. So we need to effectively deal with that um, if putting them in this enclosure with 24. So that's why we've got that uh, quite beefy enclosure there on that. Um, but we do have um, other different options as well for, for U.2 slots if you need them. Um, here's the back of the unit. Um, this is the back of the higher spec unit. So over on the left, you can see the four um, SFP28 connections. Um, if it was the lower spec unit, it would only have two of those in slot five. Um, but as you can see, it's got five PCI Express slots. All of them are Gen 4, um, varying speeds. You can see that at the top right. Um, but yeah, very easy to, to expand this unit. And um, there's two thumb screws there. Um, you can pop those out and the whole uh, mainboard tray comes out the back. So everything comes with that, um, such as the, um, uh, the the fan module, um, everything. So if you wanted to upgrade the PCIe, change the RAM, do, do some maintenance on the unit, it's very easy to do it. Once this unit's rack mounted, it should never have to come out the rack. The drives can be changed out the front very easily um, and everything else can be done straight out the back. The whole tray just pulls out so you can put it on a workbench to work on it much easier if you need to. Um, so it's just a, a lever action there to pop that down. Here's a labeled up drawing of the motherboard. So you can see uh, square in the middle, we've got the AMD Epic CPU, depending on the flavor you've got. That's either a 16 core 32 thread or an eight core 16 thread. Um, and we've got the uh, 16 RAM slots, eight to either side of the CPU there. And you can see the, uh, the, the five PCIe Gen 4 slots that are also on the back. So what makes this uh, uh, CPU excellent for this um, uh, this role as a all flash array is traditionally how we've had to do this. Because we have got other all flash arrays. Is they're generally configured either like the option on the left or the option on the right. Um, so for the SAS units, we generally go. <clears throat> Uh, with multiple SAS controllers. Uh, the downside of this is each SAS controller is generally linked at just Gen 3 by 8 um, for each eight SSDs that you will. So as you go through the uh, the different sort of structure of how you're setting it up, the more drives you put in, the more SAS controllers you need. Um, and you're effectively stealing away the PCIe bandwidth from the CPU for the SAS controllers, which will ultimately bottleneck how fast you can run uh, data through the device. Um, on the right, we've got other options with a SAS controller with expanders. So depending on how you look at this one, uh, you are limiting all 24 drives through a single PCIe connection if you go this route. Uh, we haven't done this option in a long time, but the one on the left is still there in our dual controller units. Um, but because they're only using SAS 12 gig a second, um, it's largely um, not really going to be a limit on the performance. It's just not ideal if, as, you, as Dara was saying earlier, if you're treating the NVMEs as fast hard drives, um, that type of architecture is not going to show the benefits of the MBMEs. Uh, when you go to the, um, the next page here, we can show you how this architecture is done inside the TSH 2490FU. Um, so every single one of the 24 drive bays on the front of the device has a PCIe Gen 3 by 4 connection, which is the exact spec needed for the SN640. So every single drive bay gets its own dedicated Gen 3 by 4 connection straight to it. 
So absolute massive performance there um, for each of the drives. There's no bottlenecks there. Every drive has the direct link back to the CPU. So this is an absolutely ideal setup um, for an all flash array. So if we look here, why you would choose NVMe, um, Dara did point this out as well, but basically the NVMe is straight to the CPU. Loads of bandwidth, loads of lanes to get that data in and out of the CPU. Um, if you go look at the SATA SSD, it's uh, sort of unidirectional, so everything's going through at half the speed of what SAS can do. So SAS is much better in that regard, but they still have the controller, which would be the bottleneck. So NVMe's um, in a unit designed for them is absolutely the way forwards. As we go through, here's some um, performance testing that we did internally. Um, to I've only got a bit of the information here at the bottom. If you want to see the full specs on how we achieve these numbers, on our website, we do have a product performance section where we do tell you everything about how we did the test. Uh, so for example, if we tested uh, things like an IOP speed, so anything like that, we use IOMeter to test uh, most things, and it would give you every bit of setting that we use. So every setting for IOMeter that we had set up, how many workers, um, the, the packet size, um, every, everything, the ramp up time, we give you all that information on the on the website. So if you wanted to duplicate the results, you're able to do that. Um, and we also test everything from uh, one connection to multiple connections. So you can see where uh, the performance that you will need for your application uh, can be met. So whether you need uh, two 10 gigs, uh, 25 gig connected, um, uh, all the 25 gigs connected, you can get to see all that information. Uh, but here's just a snippet of the performance we were able to achieve there as well. Okay, so that's the uh, the end of the slide. So what I'll do now is I'll jump into the interface of the unit. So here I've got a unit. I've only got four of the uh, SSDs added in at the moment. Um, so here we've got four of the, uh, the WDS N640s. We can see down here at the right hand side that the maximum speed of the drive is a Gen 3 by 4, and that's what we're currently connected at. And you can get some other information from the disks here by clicking through different information. So you can get information on the disk health, uh, the estimated life remaining. So if I was to click in uh, on disk info, we see basic information, the uh, the type of the uh, firmware version, things like that. If we click on disk health, it gives us extra information like how many um, uh, uh, days and hours it's been powered on for, things like that. So you get a lot of good information from the SSD. Um, if I go across to these storage and snapshots, we can see how I've got it set up. So if I was to go check the storage pool, so I can show you uh, before I do the performance demo, just how the storage is configured. Um, so here, if I maximize this out when it loads, uh, we'll see that we've got two RAID 1s, which are striped together as a RAID 10. So if I scroll down here, we've got the two drives, uh, the first two drives in a RAID 1, the uh, drives 3 and 4 in a RAID 1, and we've got those striped together as a RAID 10. Um, so I'm not doing a, any RAID 0 trickery here or anything like that. You know, a, a RAID mode you generally wouldn't um, use in production. So we, we have a, a RAID mode that a lot of our customers would use. Uh, and you can also see a, a snippet of some of the new features we've got here. So the, we've got the QSAL feature there. I do have it disabled on this unit. Um, I, I wasn't, um, I didn't have the latest firmware version when this was uh, added a couple of weeks ago. I already had the storage volume created. Uh, but if you've basically got um, uh, some over provisioning set on your SSD, so you can configure that. So you can configure the, uh, the pool over provisioning. So if you wanted to limit the amount of capacity uh, used by the SSDs, you know, with some SSDs, um, the performance is going to be better if they're not full. So here you, you can set the pool over provisioning. We allow you to set this up to 60%. Um, the way the QCell software is going to work is it's going to get to let the drives get to about 50% life remaining. All the SSDs will largely be at about the same level up to about 50%. Uh, once they get to the 50% mark, then we're going to start doing um, the, uh, the anti-wear leveling. So we're going to start making the SSDs get used in different ways so that they don't all hit 100% uh, used at the same time. Effectively, we're doing this by swapping out which bits of data is used by the over provisioning and which is used for actual storage. So we're going to start rotating in and out. So the capacity is largely going to remain unchanged when you're using the QCell feature, but it's definitely going to give you um, a much better lifetime on the unit. So instead of always using if you had an over -provision provisioning set at 50%, instead of just the first 50% of the drive being written on, we're going to start swapping in the over provisioning data. So eventually over the life of the product, we're going to get a good wear across the whole surface of the disk um, so that we're not getting um, premature failures or all the drives failing at the exact same time. So that's a really good feature that was just added in the last few weeks. Um, so you can enable QSAL. You do have to have the over, -pro over provisioning option set to be able to enable that. 
Okay, so if I go through how the uh, device is configured, so I've just got a one gig connection to the 2.5 gig port for management purposes. That's how I'm connecting into the device. As I scroll down there, I've got Adapter 5, which is one of the 25 gig connections. I've got that linked up on a, uh, a Class C subnet there, just a 192.168.0.2, uh, which I've got allocated through to my VMware environment. So I do have a, a virtual machine here, my Ubuntu 3.1, that's connected with its entirety of its storage um, on the WDSN640 drives, which I've got in inside the uh, TSH2490 there. So I've got it all running on the one machine. And I've also given this uh, virtual machine an IP in the same range because I've allocated the 25 gig connection that's also in this uh, VMware host through to it. Uh, so if I was to go back over here, one second. Uh, if I go back to the resource monitor, we can see that the unit's largely sitting at idle. Um, but with the virtual machine that I've got running here, I've got an iperf 3 server listening here. Um, so this is uh, listening on the uh, the Class C subnet that I've got. So what we're gonna do is I'm just gonna pull in a command line from the NAS. So this is running on the NAS itself and I'm gonna do an iperf 3 test um, direct through. So it's gonna send data from the NAS uh, across to the virtual machine using the 25 gig link. Um, so we're just gonna see that the, the performance that we can drive and we should see that reflected down here at the bottom left as well. So I'm sending over um, 100 gigs of data here. It should take about 40 seconds to complete, um, but we can see there that that's now refreshed. The physical network usage has just gone up. So we're able to completely max out the connection. Um, obviously this unit does have four of those connections. So if you had more than uh, four of the SSDs and if you had it fully populated with all 24 drives, um, even four 25 gig connections is going to get saturated. Um, so that's where we've got the other options that I mentioned earlier, things like 40 gigs and we've got uh, 100 gig Ethernet options. They're all dual port cards. So whether you're using 40 gig with QSFB plus um, or you're using um, uh, the, the 100 gig, you've got lots of different options there uh, to get the, the performance through. So there we go, 100 gig was transferred in just about 37 seconds. So really fast, uh, those drives are able to drive that performance really well. And the other key thing I think is that with NVMe, it's not just about the performance, the, the raw performance is that the latency, the turnaround time and the quality of service you're gonna get is consistent because their millisecond response time is much faster and a bit more parallelization than, than SATA drives, right? Oh, absolutely, yeah. So that's that's the major thing. So quite often with NVMe, it's really not really about the megabytes per second. It's more about the IOPS that they can deliver. Um, and you know, running this virtual machine here, so um, in the in the VMware environment, I've only got one of my ESXi hosts here uh, connected to this uh, H2490, um, and the the virtual machines that I've got hosted on it uh, are absolutely flying. It's just so responsive. You ask them to do anything, it's so instantaneous. Um, the other hosts I've got here, I've got 10 gig links to an as running SATA SSDs. Um, it's not as responsive as, as as over here on this this main host that I've got it running on. Uh, so this one is just a dream to work with. So yeah, it's very, very fast. And one of the cool things is it's, it's a very short depth, very small unit as well. So I've actually got it on a shelf in my uh, 600 mil, uh, 600 centimeter deep uh, rack cabinet as well. So it's, uh, sorry, 600 mil. So it's it's a very small rack cabinet wall mounted and it fits in there with the door closed surprisingly. So we've got some one new rack mounts that are a bit longer that I can't do that with. So um, for the power that you get, the, the compact form factor is absolutely amazing for this unit Plus, as well. Plus it's so. also gonna be a lot lighter to cart around than a bunch of hard drives. <laughs> Oh, absolutely. I've, I've rack mounted a few of our big 24 bay with three and a half inch drives before and uh, yeah, they're, they're not fun to rack mount. Even with two of you, there's only so much room either side of the rack cabinet to sort of get a hold of it and slide it onto the rails. Um, yeah. So yeah, generally my preference on those big 24 bays is definitely uh, get the drives out before you rack mount it. But with this unit, uh, no problem. One guy can do it. It's not heavy. It's I think the unit only weighs about 15 kilos empty. Uh, only about 20, uh, 20 kilos, fully populated, even with a few extra PCIe cards shipped in. It's, it's really, really light for what it is. Okay, so that's largely um, everything that I, I wanted to cover off on the session. If anybody does have any questions uh, for, for me or Dara, please do let us know. We'll be able to, to go through them, perhaps show you anything that you want to see. Um, so it's a, it's a very powerful unit, very easy to use. You can set it up with uh, NAS shares. You can use it for... Um, uh, virtual machines over an iSCSI link if you want. We support practically every major network protocol, SIFS, NFS, SMB, AFP. Um, so you can really use it in any uh, in any environment or setup that you need it to. 
Excellent. Thanks, Craig. It's great to see kind of how they're actually applied in real life because you can see the you can read a data sheet, but it's until you put them in a scenario where they really push the limit that you can actually appreciate the speed of them. I think one thing we didn't mention on the 640 is that it's got configurable endurance as well. So you can actually uh, change it from 0.8 up to 2 if you want to uh, change the profile of the drive. Um, so let me see on some of the questions. Uh, somebody was asking about the installation. It looks looks pretty easy there on the, the front accessibility with the, the front loaders. Uh, are the NVMe drives themselves easy to install? Oh, very easy. So if, if I bring the first page of the slide in, you can sort of see the bottom of the drive tray. So we do supply um, in the box, we'll give you 96 screws, but basically it's four screws per drive. And we give a couple of different mounting hole options for them. So if you're using just a straight up U.2 NVMe drive like the uh, the SN640 here, you can just plug them straight into the first screw hole um, and it's going to position the uh, U.2 connector in the perfect place uh, for it to connect to the back plane. Um, if you're using one of our drive adapters, like I mentioned on uh, one of the other slides, uh, they're a bit longer because um, there's extra controllers and, and bits and bobs there. Uh, you can use the extra holes that are a bit further back so that it can still situate uh, the U.2 connector in the perfect place for the back plane. Uh, but you're yeah, very easy to do swap outs, whether it's drives out the front or whether it's the entire um, system tray out the back so that you can do upgrades so once it's rack mounted it really never has to come out again okay um and then you said there's a hundred giggy card available is that shipping now is yes it's shipping today um i've got i've got my first sample i think arriving later today so i'm watching the old security cameras here to see if the courier is coming while i'm on the session i hope not he might run away with it uh but yes we've got the it's an intel uh, e810 chipset um so dual 100 gig uh, connections uh, and as i as i mentioned earlier we've got the uh, the two different options for for cables that we'll supply but of course you can just go get um, any transceiver that you want um it's not just for use in the nas either there is windows drivers so if you wanted to plug it into a windows server by all means um, you can do that. We've got drivers for that. It is just the Intel driver pack. It's nothing that we've done special to, to the cards, but it's not a QNAP driver needed. Um, but yes, this is the only NAS that um, it works in right now, simply because this is the only NAS with uh, fast enough PCIe connections uh, to mm -hmm. drive the 200 gig. You need, you need PCIe Gen 4, ideally, uh, if you need to drive both connections. It will work in a Gen 3, but you might not be able to use both ports. And what kind of drive count would you need to, to fully saturate that? Ooh. I think uh, I think you'd be ruining if you did, went with any less than all 24, to be honest. But yeah, uh, yeah it, it just depends what you're doing. There's no straight up rule on it. It does depend what the requirement is. So uh, obviously 100 gig Ethernet is really fast at getting data through it. Um, but largely, if you would say doing IOPS related data, uh, smaller, smaller uh, packets, that sort of thing, um, even a 40 gig uh, would, would be fantastic for that. But yeah, the, uh, the 100 gig is the, the, mm. the sweet spot right now really fast a okay, couple of questions coming in uh, chat window from john how's the life of the 640 compared to the red pro hdd and tbw so i guess the the 640 is available in 0.8 or two drive writes per day which is about twenty three thousand terabytes written where your red pro hard drive um is quoted in kind of annual workload um i think they're in the region our reds will vary between three and 500 kind of terabytes annual workload written. Um, so you have to compare them kind of on that kind of basis. But the applications are, are vastly different, I guess, um, in the NVMe space. This is kind of targeted at hot storage, active data um, that you're going to be pinging with very low latency. You're just never going to get that latency with a hard drive. So it's probably about storage tiering. Or this would be your front end unit and you might, uh, as Craig has, different links going off then to secondary units if you wanted um, capacity storage at lower cost, I guess is probably the best way. Wattage comparison, um, I don't have the watts uh, in front of me there. Um, if you go onto our website, just on the data sheets, you'll, you'll get them uh, available there. But I think the efficiency of the the NVMe SSDs is going to be much better than hard drives because they can drop essentially to uh, very low power states very quickly and come back on again. So um, over time, when you're doing your power consumption monitoring, that's it's going to work out better with SSDs. And 
Um, so it was a question for Craig, again from John, how about smaller NASes that will take, say, 6 to 8 uh, of the kind of 640 type U.2? Any other NAS units that you have that are kind of on the more mainstream angle? So I, would say, I would say watch this space for the moment. Um, there's some things in the pipeline. We do have a desktop NAS that could take two of them. Um, yeah. But it's um, it's a nine bay chassis where it's got uh, four two and a half inch bays down the bottom where two of them are U.2 uh, uh, NVMe compatible for the SN 640. Uh, but mm -hmm. I'd say watch this space. We're, we're working on different uh, different options and ideas. I think uh, so far the the first one that's going to take benefit of it might be one of our ES NAS, um, the the dual controller NAS. I think that's the the next one that's going to be launched that takes U.2s, um, mm -hmm. but it's it's still going to be a larger 24 bay, I think. Um, but yes, we do have um, some ideas for some smaller options, but um, nothing concrete just yet. You're right. I think we did a review recently with with that unit. It's a I can't remember the model number. Is it like a six or eight hard drive bay with the two? Uh, H, the TSF H973 AX, I think it is. Yeah. Um, for those model number remembering, if I ever thought our model numbers were confusing, you you won the. <laughs> you oh won no, the we 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 definitely. As you can see here on the screen, I've got the hundred gig Ethernet part code, so it's uh, uh that's um, quite long. Okay. But that's that's the hundred gig card. I just see Christos has asked a question there about the hundred gig card. So um, there's there's the the part number of the card that we've launched that is available today. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. For so um, if you want to take that from Manuel, do UMP adapters lower the performance? And what's the best RAID recommendation? I know you were running RAID ten on the config that you showed there. If you want to comment on the UMP? Uh, so yeah, the UMPs. There, there is going to be then something in between. So effectively, some of some of our uh, QDA adapters, the the UMP adapters, some of them will have a mini RAID controller on them. So, for example, if you were to have one with the two M.2s, um, you can either have them pass through, which should be the best for performance, uh, or you can actually bond them together as a RAID zero within the chassis or a RAID one if you wanted within the enclosure itself. Um, but doing that, you will lower the performance a little bit to do that. So, if you can go native, go go straight on. Uh, U.2, something like the SN640, straight in the drive bay, it's going to give you the most performance. It's just if you have, happen to be sat on a bunch of um, M.2 drives and you want to use those as well, um, you can use them uh, with our QDA adapters as well. Um, but yeah, it's still best to go completely native. There is, it's, it's not a free conversion, if you like. Hmm. I think there was a, a follow-on question I was talking about from multimedia use. I'm not sure what... Uh, context that was in, whether it's for editing, like uh, I guess if you're doing near line editing on something like this, um, yeah. then it's video of, editing, I think you've got more performance than you ever need. It depends how many video editors you're doing, what sort of level of resolution you're doing, things like that. But even doing 4K video editing with a up to 10 of you doing it, you know, you're going to have performance in spades. You know, you're going to have performance left over for people to be ingesting new footage to be worked on, uh, render to be happening at the same time. You know, absolutely no problem on a, on a unit like this. It's It's got all the performance in the world for anything like that. Um, I think a, a smaller office doing video editing, things like that, which they typically be to be smaller than you know, thousands of users in these places. Um, it's going to be hard enough to get enough users to actually push this unit to the max, especially if you've got Got it full of SN640s, that's for sure. So, um, I see another question there from Christos. Um, if I connect QNAP with this network card to a 100 gig switch with LACP, could I have a real throughput of 200 gig? Yes, absolutely you could. So if I was to switch over there to our network and virtual switch, I closed it instead of opening it. Uh, we do have port trunking options. So if I do this with some of the uh, 25 gig connections, for example, um, <clears throat> Let me pull that up. So if I go across to the interfaces, you can see at the very top here, we've got a port trunking option. So if I was to say use ports uh, three and four, these 225 gigs that haven't got in use, I can go into the port trunking. I can add a trunking group. Um, I could add ports uh, three and four um, to the same trunking group. So just simply tick boxes next to those. Uh, and then you've got different options. So we give you a little wizard here to try and help you pick. Um, but LACP is down at the bottom. So if you've got a managed switch, you can choose that one, choose next, and then you can choose which option you want. Most people would want the one that's default selected there, the 802.3 AD. Uh, so yes, you can set that up if you want to um, to create a connection. Now, a, a common misconception, it's, it's LACP, it's not going to give you, if you transfer one item, one file, 
from one user to the NAS, it's not going to give you 200 gig, it's going to give you 100 gig, but it will allow you so that the next transfer that happens is going to go down the other pipe. So it's going to be two 100 gig transfers simultaneously. Looks like they're both going to the same device down the same connection, uh, but that's how it's going to load balance it. So it's effectively like a load balance connection. It's not going to be um, sort of a, a completely bonded connection where the 100 gig looks like 200 gig for one user and um, if the user is doing you know multiple things at once then yes it's going to go faster or if you've got two separate people connected um with 100 gig it's going to put them down um, and load balance the different pipes so that's how okay. that's going to work great i think we've covered most of the questions there there's a final one was about the um some of, i think this is the first um nas or flash unit that's really been SSD aware. So you've got features both built into ZFS with the copy on write and some of the deduplication. Um, plus you've got your your Hero OS, which has the, the new QCell feature, which I think you said is kind of a free add-on for anybody um, that, that, that deals with wear leveling in an intelligent way, which actually increases the potential endurance of your SSD over and above what you may be kind of getting on the data sheet. Um, just a quick comment on that before we close. I think that's, that's yeah. the first time we've really seen so the, the operating system being conscious of SSDs. So I, I've kind of set it up in a non-ideal way. It's, it was just really for a demo. I'm not putting a lot of data on it, but what you should really be doing when you first set this unit up, um, we've got a little um, SSD over provisioning tool that you can run on the NAS. So uh, when you're in here, um, in, in the app sensor, we do have a, an SSD over provisioning tool. I don't think I've got it installed on this one, but you can you can run this tool. It's gonna go off and check your SSDs. It takes a little bit of time. It's gonna run a performance test on the SSD with it completely full, um, down at 90%, 80% uh, 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 and so on, all the way down. Um, and we will allow you to uh, pick from the chart you can see which is the best balance between the amount of capacity and performance. So especially in say the lower cost end of the SSD, some SSDs they have, you know, a peak rate that, you know, it can do this speed, but only for this much of the capacity. If you've got it more than uh, say 40% full, uh, the performance is gonna drop. And we give you the performance figures at the different capacity thresholds. Um, so let's say you go with the max setting. So we will allow you to do a 60% over provisioning. So we're, we're basically gonna take away 60% of the capacity. Um, so that's step one, that's, that's gonna guarantee you the performance, um, but you can configure that and you can change that setting anytime you want. Um, so here you've got the, the pool over provisioning. So you've got an option here where you have to set this number uh, between one and 60. So we will allow you to set it up to a to higher level. And um, so with 10% sets here, it's not necessarily the optimal. Um, maybe I would get faster speeds over a longer period if I'd set that to 50%. Now, what's gonna happen with the QCell feature is as every drive gets to the, uh, uh, the, the life remaining, if you like, of 50% uh, left. So if I go back to the disk screen, so down at the bottom right here, you can see the estimated life remaining. When all the drives have hit about 50%, they'll get to 50% equally. But from 50% down to zero, we're going to start using the QCell technology, which is effectively going to swap out whatever you allowed to be in the over-provisioning, effectively blocked off in the over-provisioned area that you couldn't use to maintain performance of the drive. We're going to start swapping that in for the data that's out. So we're gonna dynamically start swapping it around um, so that your 50% life remaining, um, all the SSDs are gonna get a, a different algorithm applied to each one where they're not all going to be at the same percentage at the same time. Effectively, if one drive fails, the algorithm has worked out that with a RAID rebuild mixed in there for swapping that drive for a new one with a new 100% life remaining, um, there's enough capacity before the next one was to uh, be ready to fail, let's say, or their life to run out. Um, it's going to do that all completely automatically. Um, and it's going to, it also ties in with our notification center. So it's not going to catch you off guard. You can set it up so that the notification center uh, will tell you uh, when these thresholds are reaching, when you should be doing something about the life remaining on the SSDs, uh, when the, uh, the QSAL is kicking in to, uh, with advice. So it's going to, it's going to advise you of what to do um, so that you minimize your downtime. Excellent. So it's sentient for SSDs. Great. And yeah, exactly. finally, it was just um, it's so 640 is a single port, and we have an 840 dual port. Is there does is dual port features supported on this model? Um, not to my knowledge, um, but I will 
have to go and check on that one. But yeah, not to my knowledge. Um, I don't think the don't 840s are on the compatibility list yet. So I think they just need to be uh, tested, run through the list. So I think uh, to get them added to our list, we don't just test one drive in the chassis. We usually need all 24. Um, so we run a barrage of tests on them. So yeah, as far as I know, no. But, so the 640 uh, is probably perfect because you said you've got four lanes running to each of the drives anyway. So you're, you're perfectly good there. Okay. No, exactly. Yeah, it's it's absolutely huge performance. As you can see, there are four gigabytes a second to every single drive bay. Um, you've got the performance if you need it. Excellent. Okay, so I think we're pretty much um, uh, back there. The only thing to close on was if I can just show again the um, if. So today's organized by, uh, thanks to our MyWD team, Veronica is hosting in the background there. So thanks for running that for us today, uh, Veronica. And if you're not part of the MyWD partner program, you can sign up online now, mywd.com. So you get access to all of our latest uh, data, data sheets, webinar content, um, and information. So with that, we'll cover the Q&A. And I just want to say a big thank you to Craig for taking all the time this morning and, and helping us out with this. It, like I said, it's really about seeing the drives in context. That's when you really get uh, the impression of how the time is now to kind of go from SATA to NVMe. So it's really great to see how easy it is to set up and how SSD aware both the the hardware from the AMD Epic with the multiple lanes through to the 100 gig E bandwidth at the back and then the OS being aware of the, the SSDs and what they need to actually function optimally. So thank you all for taking the time out today to join us. Uh, if you have any further questions in the future, just drop uh, an email to the, the host and we'll get back to you. So it's thank you from me, Dara in Dublin and a uh, big thanks to Craig in Berkshire for taking the time this morning and we hope to see you all again sometime soon. Thanks very much. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Bye. Thanks, guys.